This is the lecture module on measures of association, risk ratio, risk difference, and related measures. This is Carol Sweeney speaking, and this lecture is part of the research training modules for residents from the University of Utah. Objectives of this, of this lecture are that the students will be able to interpret risk ratios, risk differences, rate ratios, and odds ratios, and recognize how these measures derive from specific study designs and types of data. This is the outline, and we'll start with an introduction. This lecture segment will address measures of association that are used to describe hypothesized cause and effect associations. These measures are based on comparing incidents among groups with different exposure status or treatment status. You should already be familiar with vocabulary and concepts from these lecture segments, incidents and prevalence, and overview of study designs. So if you have not viewed those segments yet, you might go back and do those first. So looking at our schematic overview of study designs for human subjects, all the designs on the right, the analytic study designs, are appropriate for evaluating cause and effect, um, whether experimental studies, randomizing people to treated and untreated, or observational studies, observing exposed and unexposed individuals for their ultimate outcomes. We're interested in cause and effect, and these measures of association in this lecture are the ones that we'll use to describe the amount of association um, related to the hypothesized cause and effect. And in this, this table, I've summarized a number of different measures that can be used according to the type of study and the type of data. So you'll notice in the left-hand column, type of study, I've grouped randomized trials or cohorts as one thing because although, of course, the study designs are quite different, the data that come out of them are similar. Individuals are enrolled in the study at baseline, they're followed over time, and they're at baseline they have an exposure or treatment status, then they're followed over time for outcomes. So given that similar data structure, the um, measures of association that we're going to use are going to be similar. So the difference, if you have a randomized trial or cohort study, an important difference will be whether your denominator are a count denominator or a person time denominator, and that will determine whether your measure of incidence is a risk or a rate, and that in turn will determine whether your measure of association is going to be a risk ratio or rate ratio. Other alternatives are risk differences and rate differences. Uh, the, now the third row, also for randomized trial or cohort studies with person time denominators, you might end up with the measure of association of a hazard rate ratio. So I won't be showing you the calculation of that. It's a, it's a bit more, more sophisticated than risk ratio or rate ratio. But it's important to have some familiarity with the concept because you will see so many papers in the clinical literature that are, do report a hazard rate ratio. Finally, the last row, case control study design. Um, you cannot calculate any of those same measures that we would calculate from a randomized trial or cohort because the study design itself and its data are so different. So instead, for a case control study, we will calculate an odds ratio. So let's start with the risk ratio and risk difference as our first type of measures. So this shows the data layout for study data from a randomized trial or cohort study with count denominator. So what you would do is take all the individuals in your study and classify them, first of all, as to exposure or treatment yes exposed or no not exposed, and then you will classify them as to whether they had the incident disease or outcome, yes or no, and then you, the, the count of individuals that falls into each of those categories becomes A, B, C, or D in this two by two table. And then the incidence of the outcome in the exposed is A over A plus B, and the incidence in the unexposed is C over C plus D. So now to calculate a relative measure of association in a cohort study using the count denominator, we're just going to divide those two um, incidence measures. We're going to say A over A plus B divided by C over C plus D. So those risks divided by each other become a risk ratio, also often called a relative risk. 
from the same data layout. An association can be measured as the difference between the incidence and exposed, and the incidence and the unexposed, and that's going to be called the risk difference. So we're subtracting instead of dividing. And an example is this randomized trial of procalcitonin to reduce patients' exposure to antibiotics in intensive care units. Though this particular table is, uh, let's just talk about the primary endpoint of mortality. And this is an actual table taken from a published paper. So they report that out of the procalcitonin treated group, out of 307 um, denominator or patients at risk, 65 died within 28 days, giving a 21% risk of death. The control group among 314 in the denominator, 64 died, giving a 20.4% risk of death. So subtracting 20.4% from 21.2%, the risk difference is 0.8%. So very straightforward. Um, both the risk ratio and the risk difference in you know, arithmetic are very straightforward. But a couple other issues to be aware of. One is what are the units of these measures of association? The risk ratio is unitless. Similar, similarly, a rate ratio or odds ratio will have no units. So to get the risk ratio, you're taking a ratio of two measures. The measures have the same units. And as you may remember from high school chemistry, when you divide quantities, the units on the top and the units on the bottom, if they're the same, they cancel out. On the other hand, a risk difference or rate difference, you're subtracting two measures of incidence that have the same units, and the result of that subtraction has the same units as the original incidence measures. Another aspect when we're thinking about these measures is the null or no difference condition. If a study finds no effect of the treatment or no difference in outcomes associated with the exposure, the result may be termed null. Some people might say negative. I would argue that negative may be misinterpreted, whereas null is unambiguous. So what value of our measures of association would represent no effective treatment, that is to say, no difference between the exposed and unexposed groups? Well, for a risk ratio, the same quantity in the exposed divided by the same quantity in the unexposed, the same incidence in the exposed divided by the same incidence in the unexposed would give you a ratio of 1. So if there's no difference between the groups, the null value for a ratio is going to be 1. Whereas if you're subtracting two quantities that are the same, the null value is going to be 0. So for a risk difference, the null is 0. Not all research data will fit into the 2 by 2 table format. There may not be an unexposed or untreated group. There may be more than two categories. In these situations, the investigator selects a category to treat as reference and calculates risk ratio or odds ratio or another measure relative to that group. So an example that I'll pick is just body mass index. So there's no unexposed group, right? Everyone has body mass. But a common uh, way to treat these data is to create three categories, body mass index less than 25, 25 to 29, and 30 plus. So for my example of imaginary data here, Let's take the group with less than 25 and decide we're going to use them as the reference category. And then we're going to calculate the odds ratio for each of the other two groups for whatever our outcome is in this case control study relative to that less than 25 group. So then I would label that less than 25 group under the odds ratio category as the reference category. And they, they have a, a value of 1 as a, shown as the reference category. Another Another measure that will be shown in case control studies sometimes is the number needed to treat. I'm not going to talk a lot about that except to point out that the quantity number needed to treat is very related to the risk difference. It can be calculated from the risk difference. It is calculated from the risk difference. So the number needed to treat is calculated from the difference in proportion surviving. And the equation I'm going to give you on the next slide, they're talking about the proportion surviving. But in a closed cohort, that proportion surviving is 1 minus the cumulative incidence. So here's how the risk difference is related to the number needed to treat. So going on to 
data with person time denominator, the measures of association will be the rate ratio or hazard ratio. So the data layout for study data from a randomized trial or cohort study with person time denominator is again going to be a two by two table. The column on the left is the same as it was before, the count of subjects with incident disease. The column on the right has changed. It is now a person time denominator, the sum of person time at risk from the entire exposed group and the entire unexposed group will become B and D. And then the incidence is still going to be A over B in the exposed group and C over D in the unexposed group. However, those incidences will now be rates instead of risks. We can measure the association between exposure and disease by the ratio of or the difference between incidence rate and exposed and unexposed. Rate ratio or rate difference. So as an example of a calculation using person time denominator, let's take the mortality rate in a classic study by Dahl and Hill. This is the cohort of British doctors. Smoking status was ascertained at baseline, and then they were followed for mortality over time. So this table is showing us in the death rate per 1,000 men per year. And if we go over sort of near the middle, you'll see non-smokers. So among non-smokers, there were 0 0.07 lung cancer deaths per 1,000 men per year in the cohort. Among smokers, there were 0.9 lung cancer deaths per 1,000 men per year. And farther below, you'll see coronary thrombrosis, a couple of rows down. Non-smokers, 4.22 smokers 4.87. So we can take those values, those incidence rates, or those mortality rates, and we can calculate the rate ratio. So for lung cancer, 0.9 deaths per thousand per year among smokers, divided by 0.07 deaths per thousand per year among non-smokers gives us a rate ratio of 12.9. For coronary thrombosis, 4.8 7 divided by 4.22 gives us a ratio of 1.15. So we can take those same values and calculate the difference. The risk difference for lung cancer is 0.83 per thousand per year, and the risk difference for coronary thrombosis is 0.65 per thousand per year. So I choose this particular, actually quite famous example because it illustrates um, an, an idea which is that how do you, do you want to present your data? Should they present the rate ratio or should they present the rate difference? Um, some papers present both, but you as the investigator might want to stop and think about what is my message here? What is the clinical significance of this? If we presented only the rate ratios, we might look at that 12.9 and that 1.15 and say, boy, Lung cancer is the whole story here. Considering that a null value of a rate ratio is 1, a rate ratio of 1.15 does not seem very impressive, but 12.9 really does. However, if we look back at the original incidence rates, we'll notice that the non-smoker's rate of coronary thrombrosis, 4.22, was very high, much higher than lung cancer deaths. So a relative difference of 1.5 um, of 1.15 would actually be quite a few deaths. So then when you look down below at the rate difference, with those units are there, it's more apparent that even though lung cancer was had a high rate ratio, the rate difference of 0.83 deaths per thousand per year attributable to smoking due to lung cancer is not that different from the number of deaths, 0.65 per thousand per year, attributable to coronary thrombosis associated with smoking. So the, the implication would be, well, if smoking was eliminated among all the, if smoking was eliminated among those smokers, we could save 0.83 lives per thousand per year by lung cancer deaths and 0.65 per thousand per year among coronary thrombosis. And so, in fact, the, um, despite the higher baseline rate of 
coronary thrombosis, um, the, the, the influence of smoking is almost as strongly seen in that disease in terms of the number of deaths per year as it was in lung cancer. So the point here is that your choice of how you present your data um, really leads into the, the clinical or public health interpretation of the results. A hazard rate ratio. So in papers reporting on randomized trials or cohort studies with person time denominators, the usual measure of association reported will be a hazard rate ratio. So the hazard rate ratio is not precisely the same thing as a rate ratio in the calculations that I showed you on previous slides. The hazard rate ratio does have approximately the same interpretation as the incidence rate ratio. It is calculated differently. So the rate ratio or incidence rate ratio are based on the sum of events and the sum of person time. The hazard rate ratio is based on the ratio of time-specific hazard rates. A hazard rate is a function estimating the risk of an event across time and the risk of an event at each specific time. I'll have an example shown on an upcoming slide. The hazard rate ratio is calculated using a Cox proportional hazards model. The hazard rate ratio is preferred because event rates may vary over time. So the concept of the Cox model and of the hazard rate function a little bit sophisticated statistically. The main message that I want to give you again is that the hazard rate ratio is preferred because of this issue that event rates in your study population may vary over time and that hazard rate ratio has better statistical properties in that situation of event rates varying over time. So this is an example of some data from a study of patients who had had heart attacks, the Worcester Heart Attack Study, and their survival after a heart attack. So on the left, the graphic is the proportion surviving. This is the Kaplan-Meier function, which we talked about in a previous lecture segment. On the right, based on the same data and the same time scale and the same study population, is the hazard rate function. So the hazard rate function is the hazard rate at each specific time during follow-up. So if you think about it, people who have had a heart attack are at pretty high risk of dying within the first year. So there's the hazard rate function. It's, it starts out very, very high soon after the heart attack, but then it lowers down and by about a year, it kind of levels out. So now the, the hazard rate of dying among these individuals who had had a heart attack stays kind of the same two years later, four years later, and so on. There's some variation, but compared to the first year, it has kind of leveled out. So if we go over to the left, how does that play out in the proportion surviving? That the proportion surviving drops dramatically during the first year when the hazard of death is so high. And then after the hazard of death has leveled out after one year, the proportion surviving, of course, continues to drop because people continue to die but it is dropping at a fairly constant level because the hazard rate function is not changing much. So again, the main point here being that this is not unusual that during the course of a study or as people get older or for a whole variety of reasons, whatever disease event you're trying to measure, the incidence of that event may vary over time during the follow-up of your study. And in that situation, the hazard rate ratio is going to be a better statistical measure to report measure of association. So finally, the odds ratio. The data layout for study data from a case control state study can look very much the same as from a cohort or randomized trial. You have exposure or treatment status, yes or no. Then you have disease or outcome status, case or control, and you can have a two by two table, A, B, C, D. But can we calculate incidence in the exposed and unexposed in order to determine the risk ratio? And the answer is no, because think about the design of a case control study. You've taken your controls represent only a random sample of your population at risk. So can you calculate the incidence of disease in that whole underlying population based on your case control study? No, you can only, you can only 
you've only sampled the, the controls, you don't know the incident, you don't know the size of the underlying population and its full experience. So, so in this two by two table, the ratio of cases to controls does not reflect the incidence, it just reflects the proportion selected by the investigator to sample. The measure of association for a case control study is the odds ratio. What we can calculate is the odds of exposure among cases, A over C, and the odds of exposure among controls, B over D, which actually re rearranges to A over B divided by C over D, which is very similar to the risk ratio. The odds ratio is an estimate of the relative risk under the following conditions. Exposure prevalence among cases in the study is generally equivalent to the exposure prevalence among all such cases theoretically eligible for the study. Or let's just shorten that and say the cases are representative. And then the exposure prevalence among controls is generally equivalent to the exposure prevalence among all persons in the population from which cases arose. Again, let's shorten that and say controls are representative. So both of those assumptions are related to the design of the case control study and to the concept of the underlying population at risk and measuring disease events in that population and th the idea being that the case control study can, can help get information about that if we correctly sample the controls and the cases. The third assumption is that disease is relatively uncommon in the population. So a summary of these measures of association. Randomized trials and cohort studies result in similar data structure and use the same measures of association, for example, risk ratio and risk difference. Risk difference has units of incidence and is useful for clinical interpretation. Hazard ratio is seen more frequently than rate ratio. The statistics are more complex, but the interpretation is similar. The odds ratio from a case control study is an estimate of risk ratio if the assumptions are met.